So my goal is to give you an overview of the medical challenges associated with travel to and living on the red planet. So how did I get interested in this? My wife, Anna, sitting in the back row and I had the um, incredible opportunity to spend uh, six and a half months of last year up on the ranch at Kuluwawa. And does everybody know where Kuluwawa is, by the way? Yes? Okay. Anyways, um, it's off the Mamalaha Highway as you're heading, it's about a third of the way up to um, Waimea from Kaduakona. So I was asked to give a presentation at a Big Island Medical <coughs> Conference this past month. It's a conference I've been attending for the past three years, and when I was first asked, I thought, oh my God, what am I going to talk about? And then it just sprang into my mind because of living up there at the ranch and what's going on at the ranch, and we'll talk about that a little bit. It didn't take long for me to figure out I wanted to talk about medical issues related to space travel. So well, that's a picture of the Pu'u. Um, it's, it's a 2,600 feet elevation. It's a hub of sustainable and renewable energy research. How many have taken the tour of the energy lab up there? Good, good. If you haven't, you really need to. It's, it's an eye opener, it will blow you away. So the SMARS habitat on Mauna Loa, which we'll discuss in a little bit, um, was designed there by Paul Pontu, who also designed the solar building and energy lab that was just down the hill from where we were staying. So as a consequence of being there, I got to interact with a lot of really Mars knowledgeable people that were coming in and out of the ranch all the time, including the crew that's currently on SMARS for mission four. First, I'd like to acknowledge a couple people that were really important to me in getting this talk together. The first is Dr. Joel Levine. He's a planetary and atmospheric scientist who spent 41 years at NASA Langley Research Center working almost exclusively on Mars. When Viking 1 <coughs> landed on Mars July 20th, 1976, Joel was part of the team, and he's still part of the team that's working on the Mars 2020 rover which is basically an update of Curiosity rover that we've all been so amazed by. He's currently a research professor in the Department of Applied Science at the College of William and Mary. And he's uh, a neighbor, basically, of mine, and he's been an incredible resource. By the way, if you go to YouTube, or just Google YouTube Joel Levine Mars, he's got two very good TED Talks that are well worth watching. The other person I'd like to acknowledge is Shana Gifford. She's the physician currently on SMARS up on Mauna Loa um, and safety officer and crew journalist. And at the medical conference, I incorporated her into my presentation. After I gave everybody an overview of the medical issues, I asked the audience to submit questions to Shana that she might be able to answer, having spent at that time five months on SMARS, and given the 20 minute delay each way, it couldn't be real time, so she created a video and sent it back, and then on the last day of the conference, we played her video, and I'd be glad to share that with you. Yeah, Matt, that'd be great. Uh, because it's accessible on YouTube for everybody, it's, and that's also well, well worth watching. If you go to the highseas.org website, uh, most of the crew members have a blog, and they're really interesting reading. I would encourage you to do that too. Okay, preliminaries out of the way, here we go. So take your protein pills, put your helmet on. <laughs> <laughs> so humankind has been yearning to explore the heavens beyond the earth for at least 2400 years. That's the time lapse between Socrates and Stephen Hawking. We've had some major accomplishments, as this slide shows, over the history of man's space flight. But let's put the challenge of getting to and living on Mars in perspective. A 
a lot has been learned in 55 years since Yuri Gagarin did a single orbit of the Earth, but the single longest duration space flight by a Russian cosmonaut was 14 months. The mission to Mars is three years, so two and a half times as long. The moon is the furthest we've been from Earth so far, a quarter million miles. Mars, on average, is 140 million miles, so about 600 times further. So it's a big jump. Okay, you came back on. Okay. Um, let's do a little planetary anatomy and physiology first, because a lot of the issues that create medical problems are directly related to the differences between Earth and Mars. As you can see, Mars is about half the diameter of planet Earth. Interestingly, the land surface area of Earth and Mars are approximately equal. That's because Earth is about three quarters covered by water, and Mars currently has no ocean. There was an ocean in the past that covered most of the northern hemisphere. It has been long gone. These are some key Mars facts. Just like Earth, Mars was once warm and wet. And you can peruse the pictures NASA sends back from Mars, and you see lots of evidence of water erosion on the planet. So at one time, it was much like planet Earth. And as I said, there was once an ocean about a mile deep covering most of the northern hemisphere. There was once a pretty strong magnetic field that's been washed away by solar winds over the eons. Why is the red planet red? Because it's covered in rust, dust, iron oxide. There are no plate tectonics going on on Mars. It's a one plate planet, but we think, haven't proven, but we think there are Mars quakes there. In the entire solar system, as far as we know, Mars has the largest volcano, the longest and deepest canyon that makes our Grand Canyon look like a little ditch, and the biggest impact crater. As Dr. Levine said, the day that happened was a bad day on Mars. So why do we humans need to travel to Mars? Why not send... Go left. Go left with the mouse. Keep going, keep going. Keep going left. Keep going left. Oh, left. It extended the it's, screen. It extended the screen, yeah. It's, it's over there. Instead of yeah. duplicate. I don't know how to do it on a Mac. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I tried doing the F4 trick, but yeah. does anybody know how to do it? On a PC, it's an F5. I think it's. Why do humans need to go to Mars? The main reason is humans are incredibly more adaptable and efficient than any kind of rover or satellite or whatever mechanical device we would send to Mars. Um, one Mars researcher has suggested that a human could accomplish in two hours what it would take a robot six months to do. It took Opportunity Rover 11 years to cover a marathon distance, 26.2 miles. So that's a pretty slow pace. Um, and again, it's estimated a human could cover that distance in a day or less, especially if they had a nifty little rover like in the lower corner there. Again, comparing Earth and Mars, uh, the total mass of Mars is only about. <laughs> Robot, where's the robot? <laughs> As Earth's 
We all know what the composition of the Earth's atmosphere is. On Mars, it's 95% carbon dioxide. Temperatures on Mars, uh, year-round average, minus 81 Fahrenheit. Pretty cold compared to 57 Fahrenheit on Earth, but there are huge temperature swings below 200, uh, below zero Fahrenheit at the winter pole, almost 80 degrees Fahrenheit um, during the summer on the day side. Why do we want to go there? <laughs> you ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> Or Mars. Yeah, Mars total mass is only about 10% that of Earth. The density is only about three quarters. Gravity, 38%, so we could all dunk the basketball on Mars. It receives about half as much sunlight as we do on Earth. A Mars day is 24 hours and 37 minutes. That's called a Sol, S-O-L. A Mars year is 686 Earth years. <laughs> Are on Earth days and 667 souls. Mars is about half again as far from the sun as Earth. Both Earth and Mars are about 4.6 billion years old. About 30 seconds. 30 feet. Long term space flight and living on Mars, um, and we'll talk about all of these in more detail. Reduced gravity, isolation, artificial environment, altered circadian rhythms. We have to recycle our resources on the way to Mars. There's no garbage pickup every Wednesday morning. <laughs> A huge problem is radiation. Another probably huge problem is the toxic Martian dust. We could probably cross out possible. Rescue and repair, severely limited. Okay, we can't dial up AAA if the spacecraft gets a flat tire. And there's a total lack of complex medical care uh, on the way and on Mars. Can I ask you, yes. What, what kind of toxic dust is that? We'll, we'll go into that more, but um, we've learned some from lunar dust in the Apollo program, and what we know about Mars and cases is probably more dangerous. More dangerous. There is probably arsenic in it. Yeah, hexavalent chromium. Yeah, carcinogens, gypsum, silicates. A lot of stuff you wouldn't want to inhale. And the problem is, it's extremely fine, like six times finer than talcum powder. Yes, and it's electrostatic, it sticks to everything. So you send <clears throat> your astronauts out for an extravehicular activity in their spacesuits, and they come back, the suits are covered. So they have to go into the airlock, and somehow, decontaminate so themselves like adequately before they re-enter their living quarters yeah. carrying a whole bunch of dust with them. So that's 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 one of the problems is how to get rid of that dust before going back. Well these if it's electrostatic then offers us a solution maybe. Yes. Yes, possibly. Yes. But Matt Damon with potatoes Right. <laughs> They're actually doing that up on Smarts. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'd like to always make the point that the number one reason to send people there is just the human ability to inspire. Kind of like the Apollo program had yes. on, on everyone. Oh, it, did. Every, it was the most televised thing in all of history. It's uh, Apollo 11. Absolutely. And uh, I think that you know the first mission to Mars is going to be the same thing. Uh, the greatest speed. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 We'll see if it, okay. If it happens again, we'll maybe start. Okay. <laughs> Let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay. So again, there's a there's a total lack of complex medical care uh, 
in deep space or on Mars. We will talk at more length on each of these also, but microgravity has effects on our vestibular system, our inner ear, our proprioception. We have fluid redistribution in our bodies because of zero gravity. <laughs> Try it with that presentation, but maybe that'll do something. Just yeah. talk to the slide on the screen. You can lower the notes by pulling down on the board. Yeah, drag the notes down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Just going to hover there for a second. There you go. There we go. We should just have to there click to go to the next slide then. So you want the notes? Do you want to see the notes? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, just yeah, get rid of the notes. I can probably remember my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Keep okay. your fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we live in a downwards pulling world, okay? We have gravity with us all the time. When you're in a zero or reduced gravity environment, the otoliths, which are those little rocks and the semicircular canals and the inner ear, which are pictured up there, those otoliths float. Okay? That sends altered signals, obviously, to our brain. And the result is vertigo and often nausea or vomiting. So vomiting inside a spacecraft is just a real mess, okay? Vomiting in your helmet can be lethal if you aspirate. It's not a good situation. It's been shown that this positional vertigo can last for days. Um, proprioceptors, those are the sensors that tell us the position of our limbs in space, the angle of our joints, the length of our muscles, the tension of our muscles. In zero gravity, we don't really need to use our muscles like we do before, so proprioception is pretty much cut out also. <laughs> Does it have a slide thing thingy on it? No, no, not, not on that, on the laptop. A you slide. Have to slide. Yes. Uh, you were able to, and then it stopped. Well, it was before. Yeah. Where Max to the next button, something. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever we need to do. Yeah, I can use that. Okay. All right. Okay, so net result is in microgravity. Well, first of all, 
in gravity, we depend on gravity to maintain the vascular volume in our lower extremities and torso. In zero gravity or microgravity, that fluid gets redistributed more superiorly. If you see uh, pictures of astronauts on the International Space Station, whatever, you'll often notice their faces are kind of puffy. Some of them have nasal congestion, <laughs> like they've got a chronic cold for months while they're up there. Um, they have headaches, and likely they have increased intracranial pressure. The, the net result of this is your body senses a fluid surplus, and about a liter of fluid is lost from the body over the first two to three days through your kidneys. That results in a relative dehydration. The blood is more concentrated, and the net result is your body feels like it doesn't need to make as many red blood cells, and you develop an anemia. On Earth, again with gravity, our bones and muscles are constantly remodeling in order to uh, counteract the gravity force vector, which is pointing primarily down. With zero gravity or less gravity, the, that impetus to remodel is gone. Astronauts will lose one to one and a half percent of their bone mass per month in space. Put that in perspective, if you're a Postmenopausal woman, not on any type of osteoporosis regimen, you might lose the same amount in a year. So, very fast loss of bone mass. The loss of calcium means a higher fracture risk. I've seen as high as 30% increased risk for a trip to Mars and back to Earth and a greater risk for kidney stones because you're excreting more calcium in your urine. Muscles also atrophy at a rate of about 5% a week. After many months in this zero gravity, astronauts tend to adopt a slouched posture, almost a fetal position, and it takes true effort to stand up straight and stay straight. It takes conscious effort and strength. Diligent exercise helps, but it doesn't really solve the problem. NASA has created this. Is this based, this, is this yes. based in any way on what the guys doing in the space station right now? I'm sorry. Are the guys in the space station are are they going through this? Yes. Right now? Yes, because they don't they don't have artificial gravity. Right. Yeah. So it's, they, it seems. Yes. Yes. So NASA has developed this really nifty system called ARED advanced resistive exercise device, which simulates free weight, ex free weight exercise on Earth, and it can exercise all the major muscle groups. And they found that two to two and a half hours a day on this, are you ready to devote that much time? Uh, plus good nutrition, plus a bisphosphonate, which is a drug class, that's used to treat osteoporosis, um, reduces but does not eliminate uh, the bone loss. So there's, even with that, there's still bone loss in zero gravity. What about vision? Uh, space blindness is a relatively newly discovered uh, affliction. The original astronauts and the, like the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs uh, were affected by it, but they didn't report it because they didn't want to be grounded. And it gets worse with the longer your duration in space. About 30% of astronauts are affected on short missions, and it just gets more the longer the mission. It's thought to be due to papilledema, which is swelling of the optic nerve head as it enters the back of the eyeball. And this is secondary to that fluid redistribution we talked about and likely increased intracranial pressure, pressure inside the head. Yes? Um, does that favor nearsighted or farsighted? Not that I know of. Not that I know I of. Either way. No. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just it's a swelling of the uh, optic nerve. So I don't think it would matter whether you were nearsighted or farsighted. Does it go back to normal once they, like the, the guys that were affected on missions? It seems to. Heels? Yes, it seems to, yes. Mm -hmm. but. Um, it's, it's a potentially mission-compromising problem. Mm -hmm. So you spend 
seven to nine months traveling to Mars, and you know you can't see that well. That's that's a real a real problem. Um, also, there may be elevated carbon dioxide levels inside uh, their transport vehicle, and elevated CO2 increases cerebral blood flow and could uh, add to this this um, problem. <clears throat> These are miscellaneous effects, which obviously aren't uh, mission limiting. There could be changes in taste. Odors will quickly permeate the environment in space. You can't cry normally because your tears ball up into one major uh, sphere of fluid. And molting is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, we work very hard on developing the calluses on the bottom of our feet because we're on our feet all the time. In space, you're not walking on your feet anymore, so those calluses eventually slough off. And the astronauts have noted that the tops of their feet seem to get sore for some reason. The change from weightlessness uh, back to gravity is a real physiologic shock and physical challenge. You may have noticed that when you see television coverage of like a Soyuz capsule landing in one of the stands, you know, and they take the astronauts out, you don't really get a full view of what's going on because they are really physically challenged <clears throat> by gravity coming back to Earth. In general, a day in space requires a day back in gravity to recover. With appropriate rehab, however, it's been found so far that you can return to normal strength. I wanted to read uh, something that Andrew Thomas wrote after almost five months aboard Mir in 1998, because I think it really says a lot. So he had almost five months of zero gravity. He comes back to Earth. He says, I landed lying down on my back and reached for my camera. It felt amazingly heavy, like a huge 50-pound lead dumbbell. He was overcome by vertigo, and when he, when he was helped to his feet and supported on both sides by the ground crew by gravity, too. It was incredible. Just putting one foot in front of the other required tremendous effort. His balance was poor, and he staggered forward, listening to the side. Over the next few days, he recounts, I had to walk slowly with a wide base gait. Fine balance skills took several weeks to return. When I walked with my eyes closed, I still veered to the side and walked into the wall. Thomas underwent many weeks of rehab, as is standard practice, with many graduated exercises, guided movements in a warm swimming pool, and massage. Even after a month, he couldn't jog without becoming short of breath. So, after zero gravity for five to seven months, seven to nine months, whatever it would take to get to Mars, he says, the real problem will be to get used to the surface of Mars, where there will not be a rehab program waiting for the crew. If we need to take emergency action, abort the landing, or escape the hatch, there would be a potential for disaster. So, I think he brought up some very salient points. How about artificial gravity? Why don't we just create artificial gravity? I think that would be the logical solution, and as far as I know, the next version of the International Space Station, they're going to try to incorporate artificial gravity. If we could head off at the pass all these various issues that we've talked about related to microgravity, wouldn't that be nice? The problem is it's extremely expensive. Um, that's a picture of Hermes, the spinning spacecraft on the Martian. That would be an incredibly expensive uh, piece of equipment, especially for a first venture to Mars. So it may be that the first time we'll be in zero gravity, but I think the best way would be to create some type of artificial gravity and just pretty much eliminate the problems we've discussed so far. If you had artificial gravity in part of your spaceship and part of it was zero gravity, then you'd have this issue of dual readaptation. Your body would have to learn to accommodate to gravity, zero gravity. Best case scenario would be like 
putting on your glasses, taking off your glasses, but it's probably a lot more complex than that. Next big issue is radiation. And radiation comes in two major forms for space travel. There's solar particle events emanating from the sun, and there's galactic cosmic rays. The solar particle events on the left and the galactic cosmic rays on the right, you can see that both of them are deflected around the Earth by our dense atmosphere, and the blue lines represent our magnetic field. If it weren't for that, we all would have been fried long ago. Mars has a very weak magnetic field, mostly in the southern hemisphere. It's not enough to really create any protection for any astronauts that were on the planet during a solar particle event or, galact or for any of the galactic cosmic rays. Probably most of the early Martian atmosphere was lost because of the solar winds. The solar winds are high energy particles emanating from the sun at one million miles per hour. And NASA's MAVEN spacecraft has sent back data that estimates 100 grams, or about a quarter pound, of Martian atmosphere is lost every second due to the solar wind, even today. Most of that is CO2, some oxygen. So think of a quarter pounder without G's bringing off <laughs> the surface of Mars every second, okay? And then if you get a solar particle event, the uh, solar winds increase to about 2 million miles an hour, and the loss of atmosphere is about 10 or 20 times that. So solar particle events or proteins or proton storms are these immense blasts of energy off the surface of the sun into space. And they seem to be fairly random. Um, and if you're outside the Earth's protective atmosphere and magnetic field, it could be fatal in minutes. Thankfully, astronauts on Mars would like to have days of warning before the SPE reached them so they could retreat underground into a lava tube if they didn't already live there <clears throat> or find some other method of shielding themselves. Interestingly, in 1972, there was a super storm almost exactly between Apollo 16 and Apollo 17 missions. And if astronauts had been en route to the moon or on the moon at the time of this super storm, at a minimum, they would have had burns and blistering on their skin, probably nausea and vomiting, and likely it would have been fatal. So that was just luck of the draw. Polar ice data from Earth indicate that we're probably in a mild period of solar activity right now. Wait, wait. So yes. why didn't why didn't they get that sun? Why didn't why didn't those astronauts get the because sun? Apollo sixteen was here, Apollo seventeen was here, and the solar particle event was almost immediately between the two missions. So there was nobody exposed at the time. And it's only three days or so. So galactic cosmic rays are mostly uh, iron nuclei traveling at close to the speed of light, okay? They penetrate very deeply into the body. On Earth, if we're exposed to X-rays or UV light, we can sustain single breaks in our DNA, and our body can repair that. Unfortunately, with galactic cosmic rays, they can produce breaks in both strands of the DNA helix, and there's no way for us to um, repair that. So the galactic cosmic rays are constant low-level background radiation. And unfortunately, when solar activity goes down, galactic cosmic ray activity goes up, they kind of balance each other. So it's either one or the other. Uh, shielding is problematic because it's been found that if you surround an astronaut with lead or whatever, the galactic cosmic rays are so powerful, they'll hit the lead and send out a shower of other high energy particles. So it could actually be worse. So probably the best thing to do is uh, retreat underground. Mice have been exposed to artificial cosmic rays and linear accelerators. And on 
like MRI scans and autopsy, they find what they call buckshot lesions in their brain. And they have been found to be apathetic. They lose their memory. Um, it's not a good situation. <laughs> Just mentioned that. Um, also, the, the, the cosmic rays are so powerful, they could cause mutations in our own human microbiome or the microorganisms that are resident in the spacecraft, and they're always have been and will be, being as clean as we want to about uh, keeping the area sterile. We never would be able to do that. So there's a potential for creating pathogenic microorganisms because of the galactic cosmic radiation. Curiosity rover spent 180 days going one way to Mars, and the radiation exposure was 300 millisieverts, the equivalent of 24 CAT scans, which is 15 times what a radiation, uh, a worker at a nuclear power plant would get. Currently, it's illegal for NASA to send a crew to Mars because they would be getting too much radiation, their lifetime risk of cancer would increase about 5%, and OSHA's limit is 3%. Uh, right now, it's illegal. <laughs> All right, um, dust storms on Mars are ubiquitous. They've got local dust storms, which are hundreds of miles across. They've got regional dust storms, thousands of miles across. And then global dust storms, which envelop the entire planet. And those occur about once every three Martian years or every five and a half Earth years. Please notice the lightning bolts emanating from the cloud. We'll be talking more about that. Hubble Space Telescope, um, approximately two month interval from the left of the screen to the right, you see the entire planet enveloped in a global dust storm. It's thought that Martian dust is pretty uniform anywhere on the planet just because of this mixing bowl effect. So let's backtrack to the Apollo program for a minute and consider what we know about lunar dust. The moon's surface at, and the Mars surface is covered in regolith. That's just a term for the loose stuff that covers the bedrock. 80% of the moon's regolith is composed of micron-sized dust particles, very fine. And again, it's electrostatic. It sticks to every surface, properties similar to silica. The Apollo astronauts found that this dust coated everything. Their hair, their bodies, their spacesuits, and when they got back into their module, it went with them. You wouldn't want to breathe it because it is so fine. Coughing probably would do little to dislodge the dust. It's thought it could cause a silicosis-like syndrome, creating pulmonary fibrosis. And it could like act like asbestos fibers, increasing a cancer risk. Apollo 17's crew, which missed the uh, solar particle event, uh, did have an interesting experience. Astronaut Harrison Schmidt and his commander, uh, Gene Cernan, had taken this walk on the lunar surface and tromping through the dust, and they got back in their module. And Harrison Schmidt said, hey, it smells like gunpowder in here, doesn't it? And Gene Cernan said, yeah, it does, doesn't it? And later, Harrison Schmidt developed what he called lunar dust hay fever. Symptoms only lasted for a day or so. And he was fine, but NASA really took note of that. Okay, they are very concerned about not only lunar dust but Martian dust. So Martian dust could be worse than lunar dust. We've talked about the fact that it's a very fine iron oxide dust, but it has other stuff in it, other bad actors. Silicate we mentioned, perchlorates which can damage the thyroid. Gypsum could cause something like black lung. Arsenic and hexavalent chromium are known carcinogens. The static electricity that we talked about in these Martian dust storms would probably be capable of splitting carbon dioxide and water molecules uh, apart and then reforming hydrogen peroxide, which could fall as a snow, 
and that's obviously a very oxidative substance and it would probably kill any organic molecules in the soil and any any chance of life on the surface of the planet is very unlikely. If an astronaut happened to have contact, direct contact with this dust, it could burn the skin. It also would be corrosive to rubber, plastic, metal. So we mentioned how sticky this stuff is, and you don't want it to get back into the astronaut's living quarters. It's also a problem for corrosion and friction. During the Apollo program, um, the, the spacesuits have basically joints or, or bearings in the elbows and the knees, and they found that the lunar dust, so fine it was, it got in there, and it made so much friction that after three days of EVAs, probably a fourth day wouldn't have been possible. There could be electrical arcing from the electrostatic charge and the dust clouds. So think about spending seven months traveling to Mars and you're coming in for your final descent and there's a big lightning bolt that fries all your electronics. <coughs> this could happen during landing and also during takeoff on the way back to Earth. NASA is so concerned about this that actually it's Dr. Levine that was charged by NASA to put together uh, a three-day workshop at the Johnson Space Center this summer or fall um, talking about the atmosphere of Mars and its impact on human exploration. It's a, it's a huge issue with NASA. Our immune system is also adversely affected by space. Um, there are so many different negative factors affecting our immune system, which I have um, mentioned there. And the immune system can be either um, pumped up or it can be throttled back. It's happened both ways. The proteins that regulate immunity, cytokines, undergo changes in concentration that seem to last the whole flight. It's been shown that some latent and dormant viruses like cytomegalovirus or Epstein-Barr virus can reawaken. And if the immune system is pumped up, you may have exaggerated symptoms. If it's been diminished, you may have no symptoms whatsoever when the infection recurs. On the Mir space station, they found 234 different species of bacteria and fungi. So again, it's, it's impossible uh, to sanitize a spacecraft. We're going to be taking microorganisms with us wherever we go. And they had a significant number of uh, microbial infections and they found that antibiotics don't work as well in space. They have to increase the dose. <laughs> so, all of that aside, how about psychiatric and social concerns? <laughs> So, it's a highly stressful experience. Um, think about getting there, okay? You're riding on top of a giant firecracker, you're going from 1G to 3G or more, and then back to 0G, okay? And then once you make it up into space, you're confined in a small space, very artificial environment, primitive living conditions. You're isolated, there's no internet, there's no FaceTime, there's no Facebook. So prior experience has shown um, with long analog missions, for instance, Antarctica or nuclear submarines, that about 10% of subjects are gonna develop a significant psychological problem. And again, astronauts being astronauts don't depend on them to self-report that they're feeling blue or suicidal or homicidal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, about 3% are going to develop a frank psychiatric condition. Given that 20 minute delay each way, at least when they're on Mars, the typical psychiatrist patient relationship, you know, psychiatrist sitting in the chair, patient on the couch, talking, that's not possible. <laughs> so it could be hard to really reveal these changes in mood or mental issues. Russian astronauts on prolonged missions develop something called asthenia, which basically just means 
you know, you lose your zest, um, you're tired, you don't have any strength, you have mood swings. So circadian rhythm disruptions can really affect the functionality of the crew. Uh, on the shuttle missions, about half the astronauts took sleep aids and they still got two hours less sleep per night than they normally would. With sleep deprivation comes uh, alterations in alertness and mental clarity. Interestingly, the background noise levels like on the International Space Station and probably on a mission to Mars and on Mars would be fairly loud because in a zero gravity environment anyways, the atmosphere does not thermosiphon. So the warm and cold areas don't mix. So you have to have fans to circulate the atmosphere or it would stagnate. So there's noise, background noise almost all the time. Add to that claustrophobia, monotony, it will probably be an international crew. And you can see that there's a pretty good chance that there will be some friction going on there. There was actually a strike in December 73 during the Skylab mission. Um, the crew became hostile and aggressive toward ground control because they thought they were being asked to do too much and too little time. This particular crew had just arrived, and uh, ground control was saying, you know, I want you to do this, this, and this. Well, we can't even find what you're asking us to use because the, the former crew had put it in the wrong place, I guess. So they were feeling time stressed, and they were being told they can't look out the window. Of course, that's <laughs> what we would all want to do if we were up there. This, thank goodness, is a potential beneficial effect <laughs> of spaceflight. It's called the overview effect. Author Frank Wright coined the term in 1987, but it's the feeling, for instance, like Edgar Mitchell, who just passed away. Um, um, looking back at the Earth, you get these spiritual epiphanies, and you're filled with awe and wonder, and you're thinking, oh my god, you know, we really live there, and we need to take better care of it, and so on and so on. And interestingly, these positive effects seem to last when they when the astronauts return to Earth. 911, space emergencies. Don't have one. Um, again, data from extended duration missions like Antarctica or nuclear submarines. There's a 6% chance per year that any one of us would develop a medical or traumatic incident requiring emergency care. So you take a three-year round trip to Mars, six astronauts, it's almost certain something's going to happen. Add microgravity, dust, radiation, the risk would be even greater. So again, we can't call 911 and have the ambulance show up and take away the sick or injured person. It's a very small ER up there, and even with the physician on board, their ability to <clears throat> treat that patient is severely limited. There are lots of constraints. Not to mention that, again, it's probably 40 minutes after you submit your question, the ground control or the neurosurgeon back at Johnson Space Center before you get an answer. So the doc on duty is truly winging it on his or her own. Everything will be altered from earthly experience. NASA feels that all crew members should have level five for physician level training for common, and I underlined, treatable in space emergencies. And that's a very select list, okay? <laughs> what happens if the dock goes down? It's not good, but the rest of the crew ought to have some basic medical knowledge. Okay, what are some <laughs> problems for space dock? <laughs> so, routine procedures won't be routine in space. Right now, we have no safe way to give oxygen, to make or administer IV fluids in space. You cut your arm, the blood aerosolizes and becomes a fog in the spacecraft. Everything, again, will be different from one's earthly experience. You can have great surgical skills on Earth, but your instruments would have no weight and zero gravity. Tissue density and resistance are gonna be different. <laughs> 
So you would feel like screaming, I think. <laughs> so any surgery, especially if it, if it was of significant complexity, would be a big risk. Let's say you're on an EVA and you fall into a lava, or the lava tube collapses and you fall and you have an open fracture of your humerus. The most expeditious thing is probably just an amputated shoulder. Okay? <laughs> to try to fix that with the limited resources is really not possible. By the same token, if you fell and hit your head and had an intracranial hematoma, and you're, you were herniating your brain because of increased intracranial pressure, it's probably just time for last rites. There's, there would be no way to provide like IC level, ICU level care for that person or to evacuate the blood in the head. So simply put, there's no such thing as life support in space currently. That, you know, should change over the decades. Yes. Uh, if uh, something were to happen, you'd have to do some extreme surgery or something like that. Um, I mean, things like alcohol or any opioids or any type of medicine to dull the pain, is that even possible? Uh, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure there would be, um, you know, anesthetics yeah. and uh, maybe even some type of uh, anesthesia that would put somebody out. But again, the whole prospect of doing surgery is very problematic. and. It, it probably won't happen. Maybe, maybe, you know, suture up a little laceration, that sort of thing. But even there, it might be a lot more expeditious just to tape it shut. It's going to be very different than on Earth. So a little ray of hope, technological advances might come to the aid of space dock, <clears throat> one of which would be a series of embedded or applied sensors on crew members that would give the dock a real-time update of their physiologic status and maybe head off a problem. And if Major Tom has a myocardial infarction or is undergoing some procedure, artificial intelligence might help to play a role there assisting the physician. This kind of addresses the point that you were asking about. NASA has a Space Medicine Exploration Medical Condition List, 86 conditions from abdominal injury to visual impairment and, and intracranial hypertension. And for each one, they say, we shall treat this, we should treat this, or it's not addressed. And that's based on eight distinct mission profiles going from three days up to six months. The longer the mission, the more likely it will be addressed. But just some examples of not addressed. Glaucoma, head injury, shoulder dislocation, any surgical treatment. So if you get really sick in space, you're probably gonna be really sick in space and might not survive it. Another list that NASA came up with that I found extremely sobering I read through most of these 304 gaps in current knowledge, and I said, golly, gee, before we <laughs> head off to Mars, we really need to know this, or know how to do that, be able to do that, and this is just some of the examples that I came across, and um, again, it's, it just shows how much we have yet to learn. So to summarize, um, I hope I've given you an idea of the challenges that are presented by travel to Mars. They are many, including the list here, um, gravity, radiation dust, all the medical issues, surgical, psychiatric, immune system. And to conclude, I think humans will colonize Mars someday, it's just a matter of time. But I hope you appreciate that we have a tremendous amount to learn before we can make Mars our second home. Who wants, who wants to go? <laughs> Are they gonna, um, having been a person that suffered from a kidney stone, which yeah. is horrific and required surgery, <laughs> And then you, your propensity to get them again yes. is really high. Yes. And so 
are they gonna send one of those machines that will you know yeah <laughs> this um, the, the machine, that, machine yeah break up. um i wouldn't look for it out of the first mission or two because <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like that's a really high possibility and then they're all going to be older so it they're hasn't all going to be happened more yet there have been astronauts that have come back from a mission and like a day or two later had a kidney stone and there have been some you know that have been in and out of space that have had kidney stones on earth but mm -hmm. none in orbit yet yes gary uh i'm just curious is would it be possible to try to just if somebody was sick just suspend them you know freeze them or something <laughs> like that and leave them that way until they got home that's that's interesting because um i'll, I'll have to give rod the link to dr giffords um video response to the questions from the conference because one of the questions was you know what if an astronaut dies and of course you know there's the whole grieving process and you're down a crew member what do you do with the body right and her response was basically well it would depend upon you know the crew member's wishes state of the born and the family's wishes and uh then she mentioned something i i'd really never heard of before we've all heard of cremation you burn the body um you can i guess it's offered here on earth right now you can drop a body in liquid nitrogen and deep freeze it hmm. and then you shake it and it turns into powder mm -hmm. okay. and she said the same thing could probably happen in space you put the body in the airlock okay in a bag um and i don't know how they do the shaking thing but you know basically you could end up with a vial of powder that take back to her but she also said some people might want to just get floating off yeah, yeah. i mean it could be like a burial at sea you know put them in the airlock and mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes sir um, curiosity of mine we're in the company of engineers and physicians um, so any ideas um, radiation is obviously obviously the biggest problem it's the number one problem and we don't have any technology to prevent the radiation right. we're out there. So do you think, or does anybody think, um, as far as uh, technology and innovation goes, are we going to come up with a technology that's gonna shield us from the radiation first, or are we gonna be able to repair, say, the double helix? I mean, um, what do you think it will come first, in opinion? Well, in medicine, prevention is always best. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and some simple things like just enough water between you and the external environment on a trip to Mars could shield you quite adequately, but there's the weight issue, yeah. So, so far, no good shielding um, solutions have, have come forward. Yeah, um, in fact, there's a, it's called the Commercial Space Flight Federation, that I think like Mars One, <clears throat> which is a, um, internet thing they want to send people to mars one way okay in the late 2020s now um, but the commercial space flight federation is hoping that uh, there will be a, a process where as long as the participant is aware of the risks and signs of release you know that nasa or osha or the faa or whoever won't prevent them from going. Well, to answer that question, that Mars One has supposedly got over 100,000 people at this time. Right, 100 now. Right. Uh, and NASA's proud of saying, you know, we don't deal on one-way <laughs> trips. We're going to bring our guys and girls back. Okay. Um, yeah. Any chance of a miniature Earth gravitational or magnetosphere, something <laughs> around the spaceship with I mean, technology, as you know, is advancing at such a pace. Hopefully, these issues will be solved before it's right now it's been estimated the mid 2030s before NASA will attempt this. And hopefully, by then, we will have a good system of artificial gravity, okay, um, to take the astronauts to Mars. And then, when they're there, they're at 38% gravity. It's been estimated that at least 15% gravity is needed for our vestibular system to function adequately. So the moon is 17%, so we're okay there. But I think technology will, will save us in this regard. Yeah. Um, I think that um, everybody who 
endeavor for uh, renewable energy and batteries being the biggest issue, um, that would solve a lot of it too because you could create an electromagnetic field like that's capable of shielding you, but that takes a lot of energy, and there's no way to put that much energy in that amount of space right. and get it up there right. you know, for a reasonable cost. And once we've been to Mars, there's actually been a fair amount of thought given to um, terraforming Mars doing planetary engineering, making it more Earth-like. You start out with like big solar reflectors that shine sunlight onto the surface, melting frozen CO2 and releasing water vapor, which become greenhouse gases, which hold in the heat. Then you can plant photosynthetic plants on the surface. They will create oxygen that you know, someday we people could breathe. It's, it's pretty interesting to read about those plans. Of course, that's a long ways away. Yes, sir. Um, I forget who said it, but he's, uh, that was actually a big topic, um, was terraforming Mars. And he said, if we had the power to terraform Mars, then we would have the power to make this planet whatever we want. Yeah, and so, it would be yeah. a paradise from the pole to pole. Yeah, <laughs> and that's a frequent question. Why don't we uh, work on cleaning up our own backyard first, some people. <laughs> that should be our prime effort, yes. I'm thinking it seems like one of the major problems would be the dust, because especially if it contains some radioaction, it's coming in on your space suit, you're breathing and taking the suit off, and it's in there, and then, you know, just putting the suit on and off, and then just... You know. Yeah, I've actually, I mean, I have no experience in this at all, you know, I'm coming at it totally brand new, but sometimes I guess maybe that helps. And I do some of my best thinking when I'm running, and I'm thinking, okay, okay, here comes this astronaut, you know, back towards his living quarters. How do we get the dust off him? You know, if it's, it, it's electrostatic, so we may be able to attract it off him. We'd probably need at least a two-compartment airlock, a dirty side and a clean side, okay? Even if, you know, with the best technology, there's going to be some dust there. Um, and once they take off their suit, probably going to need to put it on like an N95 mask to filter out any ambient dust in the air and the dirty airlock and, and there's lots of things to think about. It wouldn't Do we be... know for sure that there actually is toxic stuff there? Is there really? Yes, I mean... Can um, levels of hurt us? Yes, yes. I mean, there's no doubt it's so fine that just by the physical nature of the dust it would be injurious to our lungs, but add in the arsenic, the hexavalent chromium, and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's certainly not something you want to be breathing in. Up to now, we have no filters for lumen particles. Therefore, I think it will be impossible to get that out. Mm -hmm. at, at the moment, we are also getting another particle in our body, and we have no filter for that. Yes. Again, hopefully technology will come to our aid. <laughs> And why do we want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> because it's there. Because it's there. I want to comment on just that. Because I worked in the early phase program, you know, some of the early man stuff. And in one of the major initiatives, uh, never put it in space. But the idea was so huge that it's what we needed emotionally to spur the research and development to address problems like these. So if we never put anybody up in space to get Mars flying. The, the, the early researchers that went on for the metal, the laboratory and programs like this, paid for th themselves hundreds of times over in terms of the technology dropouts that came as a result of those research programs. Why don't we do it on Earth? We need big ideas mm -hmm. to captivate people and to motivate people to do the work. Yeah. That's my experience. I got one for you. What's the most uh, recognized picture on this planet? Still is. Yeah. And uh, again, when I was saying earlier, um, yeah. okay. humans have the ability to inspire. When you put a person up there, people relate to another person being up there. You know, they can get a lot more work done. They can synthesize information, and they can use critical thought that a computer can't do yet. You know, they, Peter, they've not put any kind of timetable at all. They have their own putting somebody there. Well, NASA has. Yeah. About, about 2035, okay. roughly, yeah, that's what they're thinking. Yeah. If, if everybody has time, I've got 
we can go through these pretty quickly, but this is about SMARS, okay? SMARS means simulated Mars. It's located up on Mauna Loa. It's a project of high seas. High seas stands for Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation. And it's designed to be as close as possible to living on the red planet. It's um, a NASA-funded program for four missions, and I heard they just got funding for further missions. The current group of six lava knots, as we call them, or <laughs> lava, lava nuts, lava nuts. Uh, <laughs> went in on August 28th of last year, and they come out this coming August 28th. So one year, six people up there uh, experiencing this, this habitat. So this is a picture of the habitat. It was designed by Paul Fontieu, who also did the <clears throat> solar building energy lab at the ranch. And it was built by Blue Planet Foundation. Oops, sorry. So um, this is a picture, a broad view of the habitat on the right, the lava knot, and their solar panels. When they go outside, they have to go into the simulated airlock and suit up and do everything just as if they were on the surface of Mars. It's a geodesic dome, 36 feet in diameter, internal two-story structure. Unfortunately, there's only a couple really tiny windows in the place, so to get these beautiful vistas, they've got to venture outside. <laughs> With Mauna Kea in the distance. It's built on an abandoned quarry at, at about 8,200 feet. <clears throat> the airlock is a repurposed 20-foot uh, steel shipping container. Carmel Johnson, who's the crew commander, um, has figured that the population density inside the half is twice that of Mumbai, India. <laughs> <clears throat> On the ground floor, they've got work areas, so these are desks up against the wall. And then they've got their kitchen, dining room, bathroom, shower, lab, exercise, etc. Food is a big deal for them. Um, one of their main focuses is having food that the astronauts don't just tolerate, but they actually think it's good. So they work very hard on that. Most of their food is dehydrated, so it has to be rehydrated, but they can add to that fresh produce that they grow inside the hab. The second floor, I think staterooms is an overstatement. Um, <laughs> they're little pie-shaped slices. This is a view into the, their bedroom. So their, their personal space is pretty limited. Um, I think now they've got a desk and a chair in addition to the little plastic dresser. Uh, Shana Gifford, again, is the physician that's up there. Um, go to the website, read her blogs. They're very interesting. She talks about a multitude of different topics. There's a poster over there on the last easel that she created that we showed at the conference talking about some of her research uh, while on SMARS, first five months. Some of our secondary projects involve stress relief for the crew, studying the microbiology of the crew, and their physiologic response to virtual reality. Here is the crew practicing for a drill that would happen later during an extravehicular activity, and that's Shana on the right. So that was all the slides I had on that, but I just thought you might be interested if you hadn't seen pictures of it before or know anything about it. Just give you a brief introduction to what's going on right here on the Big Island. Uh, and another, another interesting fact I came across preparing for this is um, the best um, the best um, I'm trying to find the right word. If you, if you take Martian dust and you analyze it okay, by a rover, the best earthly comparative sample comes from Ku'unene off the Saddle Road on the Big Island up here. And if you look at the spectral analysis, it's pretty darn close. Wow. So it's probably not a bad idea to put the Mars habitat on the Big Island too. And this is the longest duration um, 
test of this type that NASA has yet done. So I don't know if they're going to try some even longer ones in the future. So far, these people seem to be getting along very well. Uh, Carmel Johnson is the crew commander, and she's also an expert in food production. There's a physicist, an engineer, an astrobiologist. Um, uh, Shana is the physician. And there's an architect, PhD architecture student from the University of Hawaii, Hawaii uh, Manoa, whose interest is Mars habitats. So when he read about this, he said, gee, I gotta be in there. I'll learn a lot about what to change. <laughs> It's a really interesting group of people, and they seem to get along very well. Again, if you go to the website, you'll see they celebrate holidays, and we're always cooking and playing jokes on each other. Yeah. Well, if it, if it dust or whatever, it's like chlorine, why are we worried about toxic um, arsenic and hexavalent chromium? Well, it's, it, it, it wouldn't be an exact you know, duplicate. Um, I think. You know, probably the only thing that will really give us a handle on it is to bring some back from Mars that we could put through all the tests we wanted Why to do we back think here it's on there? Earth. Do we have we do we have samples or well the rovers had like drilled into rocks and such and yeah. done analyses of what they find there. Um, oh. but probably what we need to do is you know just go along various places on the planet and scoop up dust. Bring it back to Earth. That's not necessarily breathing stuff. Just down in the rock or right. drilling. Exactly. So. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Dr. Levine worked very hard, and it's ready to go as soon as they get funding. It's a it's a rocket powered Martian airplane. Okay, that would fly at about a mile above the surface of Mars. Um, and do kind of a pattern like this and cover pretty much all the surface. Um, it would only be up for like a day, but they figure they can get more data from that rocket powered plane than they could get from satellites on the atmospheric composition. And especially they're looking for methane. There are actually three places on Mars, the three known oldest places on Mars, the rocks there are probably close to 4.6 billion years old, which is the, how old the planet is. There are meth, there's methane in those areas. Methane on Earth is almost entirely biogenic, okay? So, was there life on Mars? I think there almost certainly was. Cows. Yes. Cows. Cows? Cows. <laughs> Right. I think it's cockroaches. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I've never had that problem before. I'm not sure what went on, but I hope you enjoyed it and got some useful information from it and it's spurred your interest. Thank you very much.